Med Evidence, where we help you navigate the real truth behind medical research with both a clinical and research perspective. Now, let's get the truth behind the data. So Dr. Michael Corrin, he can sing right along with that song, right? Actually, my singing voice is used to evacuate buildings in case of fire. <laughs> and yet you're a musician and a uh, you know proud performer, right? I have. I actually had a gig that I got paid for recently. I was oh, wow. quite proud of that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But yeah. I guess in all the bands that you've been a part of, uh, you've just never opted to take on the lead singer role. You've punted that to others. Uh, <laughs> I've been wrestled to the ground when I tried. <laughs> oh, okay. Dr. Michael Korn is here with us with Encore Docs. Encore Docs, of course, they uh, are very much involved in clinical research, medical research right here in Northeast Florida, including here in St. John's County and St. Augustine near Flagler Hospital. And you can learn more by going to Encore docs.com that's encoredocs.com and lots of stuff to talk about with dr corn he joins us once a month around this time he also joins us every monday morning around 8 25 we talk about all these medical health studies that seem to come out about every hour or so with more information uh, one of the ones i wanted to start out with which has been pretty heavy in the news in the last couple of days this notion that the way you reacted to the covid vaccine is an indicator of how effective it was. So if you're somebody who had the COVID vaccine, a Moderna, <clears throat> Pfizer shot, and a booster shot, and you kind of got hit a little hard, you know, maybe you just felt flu-like for a day or two, you had really good response, as opposed to the folks we all know who got the COVID shot or the booster, Dr. Corrin, who said, ah, I barely felt a pinprick and I felt 100%, all, n- never had a problem. Sure, sure. So this gets down to the concept of <clears throat> your, <clears throat> excuse me, your antibody level. Okay. And... Um, people that have a higher antibody level and they have an immune system that's on guard and ready to attack are going to have more of a reaction. Okay. So quite simply, let's say you had COVID three months ago. Mm -hmm. Well, your body's ready. So if you get a booster, you're being exposed to the antigen. And when you get exposed to the antigen, your body's going to fight back. Oh. Whereas if you had not been recently exposed to the antigen or never exposed to the antigen, you may not have that response immediately. Okay. So does that same theory work with other uh, vaccinations like the flu shot? I mean, if I feel really kind of and a little bit flu-like from getting the flu vaccine, does that mean I'm better prepared to uh, tolerate getting the flu? Broadly, but not exactly. <laughs> that's a good that. lawyer answer for yeah, a exactly. doctor. There you go. Exactly. Um, that's the, your, your level of immunity is one of the elements. And then some people respond to other elements of the vaccine. So especially in older school vaccines, there are more other ingredients that are involved. And one of the reasons we're developing the new messenger RNA vaccines is they're actually pure. They just teach your body to produce the antigen and then in turn creates the immune response. And some of the older stuff, for example, vaccines that were developed in eggs, Mm. they have a little bit of egg protein in them and that could be a source for a bit of a reaction. They have other things that allow these vaccines to produce their, produce their immune response rather than just teaching your body to make the antigen. Okay. Hey, if you're just uh, hopping in your vehicle, turning the radio on, that's the voice of Dr. Michael Corrin. He is with Encore Docs, and uh, we talk about clinical uh, medical research and the latest data that's out there and try to get a good perspective on it so that we understand it just a little bit better, at least from a patient-consumer perspective. Getting back to the, the COVID situation, mm-hmm. yesterday, uh, President Biden rolled up his sleeve and got the booster shot for the Omicron variant, and he encouraged everyone to get a booster. What are your thoughts? Well, I've gotten a bu- booster, and I will get another one at my one-year anniversary, which mm-hmm. is coming up. So I do believe in that. Mm-hmm. We are in cold and flu season. Usually it starts around October. We've had an early start this year. So I'd encourage everybody to develop a personal cold and flu season strategy for your health. Mm -hmm. And that for a lot of people will be a vaccine. Or if you choose not to, for whatever reason, what do you do when you get sick? And what what type of measures you're going to take to minimize your exposures and to hopefully minimize your spread to other people who may be vulnerable. Looking into your crystal ball, I mean, what kind of winter are we going to have with COVID? Oh, it's going to be a nasty winter. The uh, well, Not necessarily just COVID. COVID is probably going to be maybe even the least of our problems, but there are other viruses out there. So we have influenza that we're dealing with. We're seeing actually a lot of RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, and that we can talk more about it and get into mm-hmm. some of the details. But it turns out that RSV may be much bigger of a factor than we previously understood particularly if you get that virus on the heels of another virus. Mm. So one of the concepts that's coming out is that there are a bunch of viruses out there. 
And if you get hit with two or more viruses at the same time, you may get pretty sick, right? That's Dr. Michael Korn once again. The RSV virus, of course, there's been a lot of news lately about it uh, impacting children, especially in places like Connecticut and uh, other parts of the country, but it seems to be pr- particularly bad in New Haven, that part of the world. But the forecast is that it will impact other areas. Whenever we hear of a virus hitting you know, children, especially vulnerable children with heart conditions and the like, we get very concerned. Is there anything we can do to protect our children and grandchildren? Well, RSV does not have a vaccine available, so that it's it, that's tricky. And it's sort of bimodal, so kids get RSV. In fact, most kids, by the time they're two or three years old, have been exposed to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so kids that have some sort of um, immune condition or underlying <clears throat> medical problems are really most vulnerable and you need to isolate them. You need to be careful. You need to, uh, help them wash their hands, help them stay away from other sick kids that those type of strategies that are involved, that involve social distancing, because we really don't have a pill for it and we don't have a vaccine for it. How do we know they even have it? I mean, how do you know that they have RSV as opposed to the common cold? You have to go to a medical facility and check for it. Okay. And not all medical facilities are prepared. So most ERs nowadays, most urgent care centers nowadays have rapid test kits for all these things. But unless you ask, you may not get it. And I guess one way to protect ourselves and protect uh, kids who may get it from maybe vulnerable older people or vulnerable other children uh, is that dreaded mask. Yes, 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 yes. And we've had multiple discussions and you know masks are not perfect, but they are a barrier that helps and it's tough for the little kid, let's face it. Yeah. <clears throat> it's hard enough to get an adult to wear a mask. <laughs> Imagine having a little kid wear a mask and right. it's more likely to become a plaything rather than something that becomes a protective barrier. Yeah. Well, wow. hey, we're spending time once again with Dr. Michael Corin. Um RSV is problematic, I guess. Uh, for a lot of different reasons. It can, I guess, like we said, combine with other viruses and the like. How does it normally play out with you know, a child, especially a child who may have some other <clears throat> vulnerabilities? Well, again, it's going to present like all upper respiratory infections typically, and you're going to start with sniffles and sneezes and coughs. And um, when it gets you know, really, really severe, the kid becomes short of breath, starts wheezing badly, and uh, hopefully doesn't uh, desaturate in terms of oxygenation, which is a really later stages and can be very serious and even life, life threatening. Yeah. And that would be the color of the child changing and other, um, elements of, of struggling uh, for a child. Obviously fever is part of it and the usual things that you would expect for any kind of viral illness. Hey, we're live at this lunchtime. We're going to get back to the music here in just a little bit. Dr. Michael Korn is here with us. He of course is a medical doctor, a cardiologist as well, and a medical <clears throat> researcher. He's been doing this work for a long, long time. Let's go back to the flu just a little bit. We hear all these reports that this is going to be a particularly nasty flu season. Why? Well, it started out earlier. And plus, this is um, sort of the social changes that have occurred in response to the economy opening up. Mm -hmm. So for the last two years, people were less likely to congregate. They were wearing masks more. They're washing their hands more. They were more aware of protecting themselves against viruses. And now... You look around and people want to party more. They want to go on cruises. I, I, I've noticed a huge number of my employees and, and people who are my colleagues have said, yeah, we're traveling. We're ready to travel. And I feel the same way. I, I took two European trips in the last few months, and that was after a two and a half to three year absence from mm-hmm. traveling overseas. So this pent up demand is getting us to commu- interact more. And when we interact more, we're going to spread viruses more. So right. That's the biggest reason. So um, those of us who are amateurs might say, well, you know, we didn't have all that much influenza in the last couple of years because we were wearing masks and we were social distancing and standing six feet behind somebody at the public's checkout. Nah, now not so much. Is that part of it too? hundred percent. Yeah, that's a big part of it. Mm. So other than getting a flu vaccine or a flu Mm -hmm. shot, what else can we do? Well, for the flu, another part of the strategy is to be able to take a pill. There's... Mm. Tamiflu is the, the trade name for the pill that's available. It's now generic, so it's not expensive. And um, if you have symptoms, you need to be diagnosed. It only works for influenza. Mm-hmm. You need to go to a place, either a doctor's office or an urgent care place, where you get diagnosed with influenza A or B. A Tamiflu has some efficacy against both, although it's probably a little bit better against A. And um, uh, if it's another virus, then you need to be prepared for that. Obviously, for covid you have Paxlovid is, is a possible antiviral drug. But these drugs work best when they're taken early. So you have to have a strategy. Okay, if I get sick, where do I go? Where, where do they do this testing? 
Uh, where do they um, respond rapidly? Will they give me a prescription if if I if I actually have a positive diagnosis? Mm-hmm. So these are just little due diligence items that you need to do as part of your preparation. If you get the flu, uh, whether you've had the flu vaccine or not, at what point does it progress to a point that you would recommend that people seek medical attention? Well, again, if your strategy is going to be to try to minimize the effect of it, get it right away. Okay. Just get it right away for the very specific reason of being tested for the virus to see what virus you have because there's no really easy way to distinguish between flu and COVID and RSV or parainfluenza or a zillion other viruses out there that are that are more worrisome than the common cold. So the common cold, you, you really don't feel bad. You, you sort of going about your business. You're sniffling a little bit. You're coughing a little bit, but it's no big deal. When you start getting those body aches and fever and just don't feel right, then you have a more severe virus and that could be influenza which again, we have antivirals for. It could be COVID, which we have antivirals for. It could be RSV, which we do not have antivirals for, or other things, parainfluenza and some others, and some other more obscure things. That's Dr. Michael Korn. Once again, he's live with us. We're taking a little break from the music this lunchtime. We do this once a month. I guess just to follow up a little bit more on the on the flu issue, I guess I was looking for a little bit of free medical advice. If somebody <laughs> is, you know, how sick should you allow yourself to remain at home without going to the ER? Well, it's a personal decision, of course, but um, um, if you're, it, fever is, is an important indicator. So if you have a fever above 101, let's say, that, that for an adult, that's significant. So mm-hmm. that may be your trigger. If you just feel absolutely miserable within the first 24 hours of onset, well, why not get relief? Why not mm-hmm. find out what it is and maybe get a pill? So some of this is very personal. But um, my point, again, is that you should be thinking about this ahead of time. Right. I get plenty of calls from friends and colleagues, et cetera, that say, you know, oh my God, I feel crap, like crap for the last four days. Right. What should I do? And it's too late. You, you know, you've, you've, there's very little you can do at that point. You can just let, lay in bed, drink fluids, take some you know, Tylenol, Tylenol or ibuprofen and just ride it out. But if you had thought about it and this happened and you say, okay, well, there's an urgent care center down the street, I happen to know that they do viral testing. And I happen to know that even though I chose not to get a flu vaccine, I have this backup plan. Right. Now, on the other hand, you might have gone through that and say, hey, do I really want to bother with this? Or there's really no urgent care centers near me. Let me just get the, the vaccine. I know I'm not at super high risk, but nonetheless, it's probably a good idea to, to try to avoid that scenario. And if you get into that problem, it'll be a, a far less severe problem. Right. How do your friends react when you say it's too late? I mean, then you sort of put it in perspective, right? I mean, they probably immediately hear from their friend, the cardiologist, that it's too late. Not something you really want to hear. Right. Well, again, (laughs) they they appreciate the honesty. (laughs) (laughs) Which they get all the time, I would think, right? Right. But uh, it's not, it's it's a common scenario. But again, a good friend of mine just had, you know, two weeks of misery because uh, she didn't have a plan. Yeah. Didn't get vaccinated. Well, I I won't go into that detail. (laughs) Uh, Speaking of the flu vaccine, uh, there are efforts underway, and you and your team at Encore Docs are a part of that effort to make the flu vaccine better. We are. We are. So we've talked about this a little bit before, but I think it's worthy of repetition. So the old school vaccines were typically made by growing viruses in egg media. Mm -hmm. And this is an extended process that requires really months and months of work. And it's a very speculative process because no one really knows what what virus is going to be there 18 months down the road. So basically, there's this surveillance system around the world. Um, hogs in China are, are slaughtered to see what, what type of viruses they have with the thought that maybe that will migrate into the human population at some point. Birds and bats and their other species that are reservoirs for these viruses. And, and based on all this data, they come up with the four or five most likely strains of influenza or whatever virus they're looking at that would possibly be infecting humans a year and a half down the road. Well, it's obviously very imprecise, Mm -hmm. but they grow those viruses. They manufacture vaccines. There's an extensive process, not only growing the virus, but then purifying it. Because when you grow it in egg media, you got to get rid of all the other stuff and you have to inactivate the viruses, make sure they're they're not going to cause disease. And this is uh, extremely extensive, extremely expensive and a process that's somewhat inefficient. Hmm. Now, with the new messenger RNA concept, it's unbelievable. All we do is a a new virus pops up. We find out the genetic code of the virus, which we can do probably in a week now, Hmm. and then we use chemicals to make that antigen. 
hmm. to make actually the the genetic sequence for the antigen. Again, it's not DNA; it's RNA, right. which is your that's your email system. Mm-hmm. So all this is is just sending a signal that gets that gets destroyed. Your body destroys the messenger RNA very very quickly, but it sends a sing- signal. You produce the antigen, and then your body knows what the bad guy is. Wow! And that can happen literally within weeks. Right. And for uh, some of our listeners, they could have the opportunity to participate in that kind of a flu vaccine as part of a clinical trial, uh, which arguably would make you super prepared for this year's full uh, flu season. Absolutely. That would be a great element of preparation is that you would know that you're, one, you're getting a vaccinated. Two, there's a system in place so that when you get sick, if you get sick, you can go someplace and find out what's going on. Right. And then three, you'll have medical professionals that'll look after you. And four, you actually get paid for it in this particular case. And every, in this particular case, everybody actually gets active therapy. Yeah. Not all the studies work that way. Some studies work against a placebo, but this is a controlled study working against the current standard. Well, once again, if you want to take advantage of this opportunity, uh, it would be a great one. You can do that by going to EncoreDocs.com. That's EncoreDocs.com. I assure you, you'll get the uh, some of the best health care you probably have ever received. We, we like to think so. Yeah. EncoreDocs.com. You can call locally. They have offices right here in St. Augustine and St. John's County at 904-730-0166. That number again, 904-730-0166. We'll be back with Dr. Michael Corrin. Shadows of the night. Gloria here on 103.9 WSOS. It's lunchtime here in Northeast Florida. Dr. Michael Corrin. Back in your band days, that would have been a good song to play. It it would have been. It would have yeah. been. We weren't really a cover band though. Oh, okay. We, we liked. We wrote songs and we liked to play them, which is very hard to get people to listen to songs. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. So when you would do like live performances and people would say, "Oh, you know, we play Stairway to Heaven," and you say, "No, we don't do that. We only do our own stuff." Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah so you remember? You, I'm sure you saw the movie uh, yesterday. Yes. And so it's an example of that he has all these great Beatles songs that no one will listen to. Right. He's trying. He tries to play "Let It Be." I think it is for his his family, and they're distracted, and and you know because they think it's an original song. They, right? They have no memory of the actual Beatles. Yeah, they don't think it was very good. Yeah, yeah. That's a hilarious it, movie, actually. Yeah, it's a, well done. Yeah. Dr. Michael Corn is here with us mm-hmm. with Encore Docs. Go to EncoreDocs.com for more information about how you can participate in clinical research. Uh, it's not going to hurt, right? It will not hurt. It will not hurt. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're making a contribution to society. And also, selfishly, you're potentially advancing your own personal health beyond what is normally acceptable in society, right? Yeah, we, we think so. Obviously, I'm a believer. I'm an evangelicalist. Evangelist. Evangelist. Yeah. How do you say that word? Evangelist. Evangelist. Thank you. <laughs> right. Jot that down, ladies and gentlemen. The first time I get to correct Dr. Corrid, huh? Evangelist. See? Yep. So I, I, am a e, I am a research evangelist. Yeah. And um, certainly I believe in this, but there's actually data to support it. So my favorite uh, quote in terms of data is that 99% of people have done one clinical trial will do another. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I've participated in those with Encore Docs. Highly recommend it. Karen on our team has done that as well. Learn more by going to EncoreDocs.com. Going way back to your days at Harvard Medical School and all that. Mm-hmm. When was the, did you ever participate in clinical trials back in the, well, I don't want to go too far back, but back <laughs> in the day, right? Uh, interesting. I, I was not a subject for, in a clinical trial. I got involved in it yeah. as a medical student and other things, but um. I, unfortunately, I didn't have any medical illnesses, and um, I don't remember any volunteer studies that I did. Yeah. But so when uh, you were a medical student, did you think, hey, you know, I would like to do medical research? Or were you in med school saying, you know, I want to be Marcus Welby. I want to get the black bag. Uh, definitely people. medical research. So really? it's interesting. Yeah, it, it's kind of funny. So when you when you start medical school, one of the things that people talk about is the personality of the medical student and what the ultimate specialty will be. Mm-hmm. So I remember my first year medical school, I had some professors that say, okay, you're going to be a pediatrician, you're going to be a pathologist, you're going to be a radiologist, you're going to be an internist. They could tell by just who you were, yeah, your personality. Yeah, basically, there okay. were personality traits that would sort of predict, obviously not perfect, but they were pretty good at it. But they couldn't quite place me. So so I was kind of in between internal medicine and surgery. Hmm. So I was a you know kind of athletic, a little jockey, and uh, so I had those surgical qualities. But I was also very analytical, mm-hmm. and so that was more of internal medicine. So I actually struggled to try to figure out 
surgery versus internal medicine specialties. But at the end of the day, I was very interested in research, and I thought that internal medicine specialties would be better for somebody who had a research mentality. All right. Well, indeed, he's continued that passion, of course. He's a cardiologist and also a researcher as well, Dr. Michael Corrin. Uh, we were talking off the air about a, a quote that Eisenhower once gave yeah, about having yeah. a plan, and that may <clears throat> be something that our listeners can relate to. Yeah, I, I love this quote, and it's attributed to Eisenhower. There may have been people before him, but he said, a plan is meaningless, but planning is everything. Yeah. It's a great quote. It is a great quote. If yeah. you just think about it for a moment, we're using it in the context of your getting ready for cold and flu season, which is really already underway, yeah, completely absolutely. underway, right? Completely underway. So if you don't have a plan or you haven't thought about it, please make one right. as, a, as a personal appeal and just for your own, your, your own self-interest. But uh, Eisenhower's point is that you never know what's going to happen exactly. So you can lay out all the details of a plan and sometimes things just change. Mm -hmm. But if you've gone through the planning process, you know what to do in each scenario. Right, right. And certainly that applies here. So obviously, if you want to inoculate yourself against the most serious consequences of cold and flu season, the opportunity is there. Mm -hmm. Whether it's through the research programs that we have or going to your local pharmacy and getting your flu shot and your COVID booster, whatever the case may be, and then knowing where to go if, in fact, you feel ill, to be able to be tested, to find out what virus you have, what other illness you have. Those are all part of the planning process. But if you think that you're going to be going to this particular store at this particular time, um, chances are that's not going to work out. Hmm. That's Dr. Michael Korn. Once again, if you're just hopping in your vehicle, you can learn more about him by going to EncoreDocs.com. That's EncoreDocs.com. Dot com. So help us understand a little bit if, you know, if you're somebody and you get uh, RSV, for example, or a child gets RSV, or you get the flu, and as a cardiologist, you're somebody that already has a heart condition, what's the danger? I mean, we know there's danger, even we laymen understand that, but help us understand why there is danger. It, it can be devastating, actually. So it's a great point and a great question. So, for example, people that have congestive heart failure are at very high risk for complications. In fact, um, if your ejection fraction, which is a measurement of how strong your heart is beating, is significantly low, let's say less than 30%, your likelihood of dying over the next five years is similar to lung cancer. Hmm. So there are a lot of things that can happen to you. And the number one thing that happens to people in that circumstance is they get sick with a virus. And the reason for that is because their baseline cardiac function is just enough to get them through the day. Right. And you add to that the additional metabolic demands of, of, of being sick and also the inflammation that occurs in the lungs and elsewhere, which reduces oxygen levels that can put you to a point where you get hospitalized or even worse, not survive. Right. And I guess there's only so many things uh, even an accomplished cardiologist like yourself can do when somebody gets in that sort of compromised position. Absolutely. Absolutely. Obviously, early treatment is very, very important in those circumstances. But if you get sick enough, there's there are limitations in terms of what we can do. All right. Would it stand to reason that, you know, if you have any sort of cardiovascular disease, you should strongly consider getting the flu vaccine? Absolutely. Yeah. So when, when we talk about this personal health strategy, your personal strategy for the cold and flu season, your underlying medical conditions are extremely important. Mm -hmm. So if you have diabetes, if you have a heart condition, um, if you have asthma, these are things that, in my opinion, should indicate that you absolutely should be fully vaccinated against anything that's predictable. Okay. So when someone gets the flu shot, like I did in September, uh, that protection is good for how long? Well, again, there's always the nuance of which strains are out there, mm -hmm. but you will have antibodies that are available to, to you or an, an, antibodies that can be produced if the antigen gets presented to you that should last for you know at least a year. Okay. And then you get, that's why it's an annual flu shot. Yeah, at least a year. And right. again, you probably have some protection beyond that, but the, the, the most... Uh, powerful protection is probably for the next six to 12 months. In the last segment, we talked about uh, President Biden yesterday getting his uh, COVID booster and uh, for the Omicron variant. So in theory, he should be OK until next October. The next election. <laughs> no, until next election, right? So is it good for a year? Is that our thinking on COVID boosters, too, that will be good for a year? We actually have pretty good data on that. So for the first six months, the protection is amazing. Okay. And then it starts to wane after six months. And depending on how close genetically the virus that you get infected is, is to the booster that you got, mm -hmm. the likelihood of being protected against serious illness um, will either be higher or lower. Okay. 
Uh, what happens in our body when we start? I mean, what, what's causing the, the you know the, the booster to lose effect after that six month period? I mean, what's what's your guess? What's going on? Well, there, there's ready antibodies right after you got a booster, okay. and those ready antibodies will circulate for a period of time, and then they'll they'll wane. Of course, your body can produce more antibodies when the antigen is presented, but those ready antibodies actually decrease in concentration over time after the booster. But the other thing is just the the drift in the type of virus that's out there that infects you. So very simple viruses like RSV and flu and COVID are going to change. Right. Whereas, you know, more complicated viruses like smallpox don't change, which is why we were able to eradicate that. Right. That's the voice of Dr. Michael Korn. Learn more by going to EncoreDocs.com, EncoreDocs.com. I heard someone make this statement, I guess, last week or so, and I wanted to ask you about this. Um, they said, you know, the, what happened with COVID was uh, once in a generation, a once in 100 year event. You have to go back to the Spanish flu, you know, right around World War I to find the last time. Is it safe to say that that's true and that we won't have to worry about this for another 100 years? Um, no, I would disagree with that. <laughs> So, you know, those of us, the, the media attention for COVID was unprecedented. Right. So, so actually, statistically, the Spanish flu was way, way worse than COVID. And the Spanish flu, I think we've talked about this before as a misnomer, the, that the Spanish flu probably started in Kansas. Right. Um, but that's a whole other story. But um, it, Bad branding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you, um, the, the, the Spanish folks were not at the marketing table <laughs> when they were passing out names. Right. But in any event, um, that was a horrible uh, pandemic, and that also affected younger people. Right. So the, the mortality rates in young U.S. military recruits who are 18 years old were 5 to 7%. Wow. Which is crazy when you think about it. Uh, COVID has obviously hit older people a much more dangerously than in the younger population and the mortality rate in people over 80 for COVID is is probably close to 20%. Mm. Whereas younger people may have a one in 4,000 or one in 5,000 likelihood of dying. Mm -hmm. But it still can be a pretty nasty illness. So, but getting back to your question, you know, we had um, a horrible flu epidemic in 1968. Mm -hmm. We had a horrible flu, flu epidemic in 1956. And hundreds of thousands of people died at that time. Right. But we had just not the same sort of media coverage of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you, you, I remember the 68 one, I was, you know, was in elementary school, but that was the Hong Kong flu. Mm. And, um, I remember that. yeah. And so there was a little bit of uh, media attention and, uh, but nothing nearly what we saw here, but it was enough where I remember in school, they were talking about washing your hands. Right. So it got to that point and, and that was about it. Uh, of course, there wasn't the focus on vaccinations at the time. There weren't any antivirals, so it was mostly just you know people complaining, sucking it up. But a lot of people died from that. Yeah. Then you had the polio uh, epidemic, which was devastating in the 40s and 50s. And there were outbreaks. Uh, I remember New York City, again, this is before my actual memory, but reading about it, where literally thousands of people became paralyzed. Right, right. Hey, that's the voice of Dr. Michael Cornett. Uh, if you have any questions about participating in medical research right here in St. John's County and St. Augustine, they have offices at the Whetstone Building near Flagler Hospital. You can learn more by calling this number. I'll give you this again a little bit later, 904-730-0166. So if you haven't uh, written it down or you can't punch it into your cell phone, you can do that again a little bit later. I'll give it to you again. 904-730-0166, EncoreDocs.com. That's EncoreDocs.com. We'll be back. The Starland Vocal Band here on 103.9 WSOS. Dr. Michael Korn, that was considered a somewhat scandalous song back in the day. Yeah, yeah um, uh, my parents told me that was about ice cream in, in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I would have bought that completely. Yeah. yeah, of course, Afternoon Delight. Yeah, yeah. So, you have to go to the Tasty Freeze on an afternoon. <laughs> Apparently, it was not about that. It, you're we kidding were, me. We were misled. Oh, my God. Again, again. It's kind of like that other song. I never realized what the song... The B-52 song Love Shack was all about. <laughs> Somebody like just explained that to me in the last year. So I'm yeah, still it's, learning. It's funny. Like my kids like to you know, talk about how progressive their music is. And, oh, I know. And, and like you said, you know, I have to say, you know, we knew about sex in the 70s. <laughs> I know. Listen to the lyrics. <laughs> right, right. You know? They were a little bit more subtle yes. than they are, they are today. Which are some, there's a little bit of magic in that, right? Yeah, exactly. But, um, so much for subtlety. Yeah. Um, they didn't invent sex in the last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> FYI. <laughs> uh, Dr. Michael Korn is here with us. Yeah, I would imagine that talk you know, from your dad, mm -hmm. that would have been interesting with you. Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah. it get pretty scientific pretty fast? 
No, I, I, actually, I, I, really, I didn't really know what the answer was, <laughs> and I just let him go on his spiel. Oh, okay. Yeah, he, no, I was talking about when you did it for your kids. Oh, uh, the sex talk? Yeah. Oh, um, I don't know where my kids picked it up, but by the time I sat them down, they already knew everything. <laughs> that is so true, isn't it? Like, I don't know where they they figure this out, like, so much younger than yeah, our generation. Uh, Dr. Absolutely. Corn and I are yeah. both baby boomers. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, well, I guess that's part of the media and all that. And it's out there. Yeah. Dr. Michael Corn is here with us uh, with Encore Docs. We're talking about everything from flu vaccinations and how you can participate in some clinical trials to get us to a much better, more effective flu vaccine. You have the opportunity to enroll in that trial right now. We do. We, yeah. we, have, we always have trials in the vaccine space and in the antiviral space, and uh, we'd encourage people to check it out. Yeah. And um, right now, for example, um, RSV is, is, is hitting a lot of communities around the U.S., and I mentioned that it's bimodal. It hits very young kids, but it also hits older people. Mm-hmm. And so if you're over 80, let us know because we're particularly interested in protecting you. Mm-hmm. And uh, even though people are over 80 were probably exposed to RSV at some point in the past, they become very vulnerable again. And RSV can lead to hospitalizations and death in people as you get older. Yeah. One thing we haven't talked about today, and we see billboards outside of CVS and Walgreens for this, uh, the pneumonia shot. Mm-hmm. Is that effective? Sure. Yeah. That's a who should get it. Uh, well, th- that's for pneumococcal pneumonia, which is a bacteria. So it's mm-hmm. different. And that's something that um, people over age 55, um, depend, you know, talk to your doctor about it. But it's, it's usually recommended as you get older. It's something you get every five years mm-hmm. and uh, can be really quite protective against getting pneumococcal pneumonia, which can end up uh, leading to hospitalizations and death. Mm-hmm. But it's a little bit different. That's a bacterial illness. Okay. Once again, that's Dr. Michael Korn. Let's get back a little bit, though, to what you all are doing with Encore Docs. Uh, I know it's a rather lengthy list, but I think some of our listeners, a lot of our listeners would be interested. What are some opportunities for people to participate in clinical research right now? Well, we w- always like to know who you are, something about you. So mm-hmm. it, all these things are very personalized. Mm-hmm. So when we evaluate somebody for participation in clinical trial, we typically have them fill out a, a <clears throat> sheet that gives us their basic health history. And we look at that and we look at the studies that we're doing and we try to match people. Okay. So as at any given time, we are running 150 studies. Wow. So we, there's a lot of different things. And it's interesting. Like some people come in and they may hear, hear this conversation and they may be really interested in getting involved in the RSV study. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we'll look at them and we'll you know, notice the fact that they've had a history of increased liver function tests. Mm-hmm. And did you ever look at that? And... Um, they said, no, not really. What, is that something I should worry about? Well, we have a fiber scan here, and we can find out if you have fatty liver, which is something that not all physicians screen for because we don't really have any good treatments for it. Right. And they'll get into our system, and they didn't even know anything about fatty liver. They get the fiber scan, they find out they have it, and they get involved in a study that looks at preventing complications of fatty liver disease. Okay. And so that is probably a better fit for that particular person because they've already been vaccinated for influenza and COVID, and uh, they have no treatment at all for this possible uh, problem of fatty liver disease and progression to cirrhosis. What are some other um, ongoing clinical tests people may not realize? I mean, we always think that it's going to deal with certain vaccines or with cholesterol or high blood pressure, that sort of thing, but it it really runs the whole gamut, right? Oh, uh, tremendously. So uh, um, we're about to start a study looking at monitoring devices for cardiovascular patients. Hmm. And so you know, with all the, the talk about wearables mm-hmm. and how we can track your blood pressure, your heart rate, your weight, uh, your respiratory status, how does that turn into good medicine? Right. So we're working with a company right now and we're looking for 100 volunteers that would just wear this new device. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's all you have to do. Yeah. yeah Give us a call. You get the device for free. Yeah, well, we might have to take it back at some point. But. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, because we see all these things, right? Well, the new Apple Watch, for example, that says, hey, we're going to tell you ladies when you're ovulating. Yeah, you know? yeah. So there's some pretty cool things happening with Absolutely. wearables, right? Yeah, we've worked with Samsung and, and right. many other companies on some of these wearable uh, wearable research. And it's interesting. Um, uh, Apple did a huge study that involved hundreds of thousands of people. And it showed that their watch can detect atrial fibrillation. Wow, and that was presented at the major meeting. So, the the challenge for uh, for companies like Apple is: do they go down the road of medical devices, 
where they have much more scrutiny of, of their methodology. Right. So, and that's where we come in. Obviously our business is to, is to uh, look for these opportunities and then present these opportunities to our local community. Mm. So we've, we've worked with these companies, but device research is growing. And literally as we speak, we're going to start this new study looking at these new wearable devices that we think will be very effective at determining your cardiovascular risk. So we ever going to get to a point where remember how Dr. McCoy had the scanner on the Enterprise and he would just <laughs> he could just wave it over Dr. Corrin's body and he could figure out everything that was wrong with you. Well, I've learned a lot from Star Trek episodes, <laughs> I must say. Oh yeah, and my my staff will tell you that I've quoted them more than once. Right, in Klingon or in regular language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, uh, yeah. The, the surefire geek indicators if you can yeah. speak Klingon. Exactly. Yeah, there's so, there's so many interesting. Uh, trivia questions that come up from uh, old Star Trek episodes. Yeah. yeah. It does point to interesting issues though, right? Because <clears> I guess people that, you know, are, are concerned about their health, if they have a wearable and does it add to stress, you know, if you're constantly monitoring your health 24 seven or is it just outweighed by the good? Well, it's a great question. And that's why you do the clinical trials. Oh, okay. So, you know, sometimes you find things that you don't anticipate. Mm. Um, you know, there's many, many examples of that. I think one of my favorite examples of unintended consequences is the develop, development of Viagra. And I've mentioned that to you right. before, but it's worth repeating, which is Viagra is what's called a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. And they were looking at it to treat angina, mm. a chest pain that comes from uh, people that have coronary disease. So they had all these good reasons why it should work for angina, but it didn't. So they did these clinical trials and people that had angina that were taking Viagra did no better than people that were on placebo. But something curious happened. They couldn't get the study drug back from people in the study, particularly the men. And they said, what is going on here? We never had such a problem getting the study drug back. And people figured out that it was helping their sex lives. Right. And they didn't want to bring the study back. So then they re-looked at it. This was Pfizer. They re-looked at it. And after spending you know, a couple hundred million to develop it as a cardiovascular drug, they spent another 300 million developing it as a, for your, urological purposes. And of course, it became the gold standard for ED. And that one drug uh, increased their stock value by about $50 billion. At least. <laughs> so that worked out well, right? Yeah, it was a good investment, yeah. And, and I would think that's probably not necessarily an isolated occurrence, right? When you do clinical research, no. you find other benefits. That's why we're tracking so closely right. how you react. Like the itchy nose you were talking about in the last segment, that may help somebody with some other issue. Yeah. And just to be clear, I don't get these benefits personally. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, all right. Just one. So that, that comes up, and I'm, I am unbiased. Actually, our company it has its claim to fame because people that have a vested interest in the product have to go to third parties that do not have a vested interest in the product. Okay. So when we do this, our, our job is to get the data to the Food and Drug Administration and to give great experiences to our patients. But whether or not things work doesn't matter to us. We, so you, are, we are independent. So you kind of have a boring stock portfolio. You can like only invest in bowling alleys. <laughs> well, it's not actually legal to invest in them, but I have to disclose uh, it. So oh, okay. it's, it's not legal. But I, I actually... It's just my personal principles are that I don't invest in pharmaceutical stocks no. because I don't want to have any perceived conflicts of interest. Do you get to participate in clinical trials? Not that I'm running, <laughs> but for somebody, but you could for somebody else. I could do. I could from somebody else. Yes, yeah, 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 I could do that. That's actually a, a, a dilemma sometimes. So sometimes we have employees that really want to be in clinical research because sure. they can see how effective mm -hmm. something is or how exciting it is, and they'll and they'll try to sign up for the study. And I have to put the kibosh on that. Right. I can't let them do that. Now, what we will let them do, though, is we, they can go to another center where they're not known at the same, you know, yeah. with, the, with the same degree of intensity. And also, of course, if there's information that's shared, you don't necessarily want to share it amongst your immediate colleagues. I hear you. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Well, if you are interested in participating in clinical trials, what's wonderful is you can do it right here in St. Augustine in St. John's County. Encore Docs has an office in the Whetstone Building right next door to Flagler Hospital, right there on 312, just uh, a little bit uh, west of the 312 bridge. You can call them with any questions that you have, 904-730-0166, 904-730-0166, or go to EncoreDocs.com. Dr. Corn, before we let you go, any closing thoughts overall on RSV and, of course, having a plan and the flu vaccine? Planning is everything. So I'll repeat that. Please, if you don't have your personal plan, your personal strategy for dealing with cold and flu season, take a few minutes and think about that. And think about how you may get vaccinated for different things. Uh, again, RSV vaccines are being developed in our clinical trial center. We have flu vaccines that are available both um, uh, commercially and through research and certainly COVID and COVID boosters that are available. Think through that. And um, if you're at high risk, please uh, consider the 
the benefits of being vaccinated. If you think you're at low risk, think about what would happen if you actually got sick. Yeah. Dr. Michael Korn, Encore Docs. Doc, thanks very much for being with us. And we'll talk with you on Monday morning. Always a pleasure. All right, thanks. Thanks for watching the MedEvidence Podcast. To watch the rest of this series, head over to medevidence.info or subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform.